Hello everyone and welcome back to PCA's Garage. It feels like it's been forever since we've been back here. It's a Tech Tactics Live episode 54 and today we're going to be talking about transporting your Porsche. Uh, let's get a little bit of housekeeping done here. We want to thank Pirelli, our presenting sponsor of the Tech Tactics Live series. Be sure if you're watching us, especially live tonight, be sure to comment in the live chat area, share your experiences, ask us questions, we'll be monitoring that. Be sure to like, uh, hit the like button, subscribe. We are trying to get to about 100,000 subscribers. That's the goal and each and every one of you that are watching can make a difference by just simply subscribing to our channel. It makes a huge difference for us because it gets PCA out there and it just make, makes PCA more of a household name for enthusiasts or just people that are looking at Porsches um, or passerbys. Just know that when you're looking at Porsche, PCA will be synonymous with that. Uh, tonight we have some prizes. We've got these amazing Porsche Club Worldwide hats that we got from Parade. We have five of those to give out tonight. In order to be eligible to win these, all you have to do is uh, put your name and where you're from in the chat area. We will pick a winner by around 8.20, 8.30. You'll know tonight if you've won one of these amazing hats. Speaking of Porsche Cars North America, uh, I want to thank them. We have this beautiful 2022 Cayenne Turbo GT, uh, the king of the ring in terms of SUVs. And we're going to be bringing to you a one mile review. We're going to be bringing to you a full review and uh, just kind of do as much as we can with this press car so that we can show you how awesome it really is. Tonight's guest, it's someone that we've had uh, on a number of times, most recently at Porsche Parade. Everybody loves him, including myself, my brother from another mother, valuation expert, Columbia Valley luxury cars owner, Nathan Mers. What's up, Nathan? Well, welcome and uh, thanks for having me, Vu. And I see that you've got your summer cut. It's warm across the United States and Canada, and that looks like you have an appropriate haircut. You know, we only get uh, a couple of good days of weather here in Seattle. I tell people that because I don't want anyone moving here because it's such a great place. So it has terrible <laughs> weather, but we actually do have a little bit of sun and heat here today. So it's nice. Well, here in Maryland, we are uh, over the 90 degree mark with 100% humidity. And uh, we're here after hours, so I'm not even sure that the air conditioning is on back here. So if you see a, a bead of sweat, just know, you know, it's a little toasty here also with all the lights. But let's get right into it. Let's uh, take a look at the agenda and what we're going to be talking about tonight. Robert, thank you. Understanding how freight moves around the country. What are the differences in pricing? how to prepare your vehicle for transport, how to receive your vehicle from the transporter, some DIY tips, pros and cons, and then we're gonna summarize sort of Nathan's tips for transporting your Porsche. And the reason we came onto this topic is because we saw uh, a lot of folks at uh, Porsche Parade. In fact, we had a record-breaking uh, Porsche Parade in the Poconos uh, a couple of weeks ago. 3,000 people. 1100 cars and of course everyone is so excited to go to next year's parade and uh, next year's parade will be in Palm Springs, California and a lot of the folks that came to the Pocono is sort of Eastern um, based and they're like, man, wonder how I can get my car uh, out to uh, parade for next year. So we, you know, these were just c casual conversations at, at receptions and, and at the after hours lounge and such and we we're like, you know what? Maybe this is a topic that we could bring to you for Tech Tactics Live. Um, you know, moving your car for events or moving your car after you've bought it or after you've sold it. And there's a lot to learn and we've got about an hour to cover it. So let's just jump right into it. I think the basics you need to understand is how freight moves, specifically how vehicle moves. So why don't you educate us, Nathan? Yeah, well, this is a topic that um is a little bit of thorn in my side, obviously being someone who, who buys and sells Porsches for a living, I move a lot of cars. And so uh, it's, a, it's a source of quite frustration. It's also a source of great anxiety for customers and club members and, and pretty much anyone who's involved. And so this is actually kind of a, uh, I don't know, fun is quite the right word to describe it, but certainly a useful topic. I do want to start with one caveat. And I, I think this is really, really important because it's sort of near and dear to my heart. And and this is, as we discuss some of the challenges in the transport business, I do want to call out that 
those who work in this industry, the, the drivers and the company owners and all that, um, they're doing an incredibly hard job, a job that I wouldn't necessarily be willing or want to do. And so I don't in any way want to this to come across is that we're denigrating what they do. Um, it is a very, very challenging job. So I do want people to keep that in mind as we discuss how freight moves and, and maybe why you as a consumer might run into some challenges. But please understand those doing this for a living, I think generally you're good people trying to do their best. So yeah, as- and not to interrupt you, but I really appreciate that you said that. Actually, before I came to PCA, I was with the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance and working very closely with uh, trucking companies, truckers. I know hours of service. I know levels of inspection. And it's, a, it's, it's tough out there, and it's tough for companies to find good drivers. Uh, there's a shortage of drivers. Let's talk about fuel and the price of fuel, the price of equipment. All of that rolled into one makes a very, very tough industry. And the customers are quite demanding, especially those that are you know, transporting very valuable cars. Um, so it's, it's not uh, an easy topic. And so I appreciate that you said that. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the first thing I want to explain to people is that um, – Moving cars is not this linear line. What ends up happening is I'm in Seattle. So let's say a, a customer of mine is a neighbor of Yuvu and he buys a car from me and he wants to ship it to Maryland. In their mind, they, they picture some nice little truck driver is going to show up at my office. They're going to load their car up on a truck and that truck is going to trundle its way across the U.S. And in their head, they think, well, it's about a five day drive. And so I load it on Thursday. I'm going to get it next Thursday. Right. Doesn't work and that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And for for a myriad of reasons. Um, But one of the problems, of course, is that a person now has spent, particularly in the Porsche world, oftentimes, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100, 200,000 dollars on a car and they've sent the money and now they're really anxious. They want to get their car. They're a perfectionist. And so they're worried. And so every day that clicks by, they start getting in their own head. Right. And so anxieties are high. And so it is important for them to understand, you know, how cars move. So let's 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 break this down just a, a little bit. So if you get nothing else out of this tech tactics, understand that the cars never move in a linear fashion and they never move according to a precise schedule. <laughs> right. So if you understand that, that'll go a long way. The basic rule of thumb is I always tell uh, my customer the car will take twice as long as whatever timeline they promise you. And as long as you work with that, then you'll probably be OK. Um, so if they say you'll have it in a week, assume it's two, if it's two weeks, assume it's four. And then when it shows up halfway through the third week, you're not upset. You'll be pleasantly surprised. (laughs) Exactly. So let's, let's walk through how this industry sort of breaks down, um, and then how freight does move. So, uh, the first most important distinction is to understand that there's basically two, a dividing line in the industry between, you know, what we'll call sort of common open carrier transport and more specialty transport okay Uh, a lot of people will use the term enclosed to delineate what they think is specialty and those are actually different items what do i mean by that well a standard carrier uh, generally does operate open and they're usually running big trucks with six to eight cars on them just like in that image there you can see how those are loaded Uh, those types of transports do the bulk of all the transporting uh, they're picking cars up from the from the port for manufacturers. They're moving cars from dealer auctions to uh, car dealerships, and they're doing corporate moves and moving cars, you know, all over the place. Uh, those open carriers represent the vast majority of the transport, um, and that's the most cost-effective way to move a car. Okay. Uh, where it gets confusing for people is those same companies oftentimes will sometimes uh, run an enclosed transport, and so. A Porsche buyer, as an example, will say, oh, great, I can get enclosed and they're going to charge me $300 more to do enclosed. But it's still with more of a standard carrier, a production level carrier, which would be different than a specialty carrier. And there's some important distinctions. A specialty carrier generally will have a couple things that, you know, work in their favor. They generally have an expertise in moving, you know, higher end, more exotic or more difficult to load vehicles such as cars with low clearance, uh, extra wide cars like Porsche GT cars. Um, They almost exclusively will haul enclosed. Uh, They also generally will be a more of a one driver uh, to each car model, which again, a lot of people have this idea that their car is going to load 
uh, in Seattle. And the same truck driver that picked it up in Seattle was going to be the one who shows up in Maryland. On a common carrier, oftentimes that's not the case. Um, if you go with a specialty carrier, uh, that's almost always the case. And so just when we talk about, in most people's mind, when you hear about enclosed, you think of the specialty character, carriers like you just saw, the Reliable, the McAllisters, the Inner City, that kind of handle cars with a white glove. But what you're saying is there are enclosed carriers that aren't necessarily as white glove service as the one you see right here. Exactly. I mean, like as an example, on that image, you can see that's, that's a, a, a lift truck. So you can see that lift gate moves up and down to basically low, uh, put that car on either the lower or upper deck. But most of the common carriers are more of a ramp style truck. And so the problem you run into with those, even if they're enclosed, is how do you get a low GT3 on there without scraping or taking off the front and rear bumper covers, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you really need a lift truck, which generally are only going to be on the specialty trucks. Um, so yeah, some of the common ones, for example, um, you know, like if you ever see those trucks that I think Toyota commissioned them, they're kind of a tarp sided truck. Mm -hmm. Those would be considered enclosed, but the actual physical layout of the truck is just like a regular common truck, uh, with all the challenges for clearance and that sort of thing. One of the other big differences between a, a white glove or a specialty enclosed carrier, which, you know, we should give a, a shout out to some of our sponsors and a lot of people are going to be familiar with these names, you know, companies like Reliable Transport, Inner City and McAllister's. I think we have a couple of those images there. This is kind of their specialty. You can see again how these cars are being loaded. Um, one of the other big differences, apart from having better equipment that's more designed for the stuff we're moving, um, deals with insurance. So we're going we're gonna to get into that a little bit later, but this is going to be a really, really important topic as well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, um, you know, you're deciding to move a vehicle from the East Coast, say, to the West Coast to go to parade or say to, to move a car that you bought. Where do you start? Well, basically, the industry breaks down uh, kind of in two. I mean, essentially, the vast majority, if you go, for example, on Google and you say, you know, type in car transport, who you're 98% of the time going to get is a broker, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes people will think a broker is kind of a bad thing. The majority of the car freight in the U.S. moves via a broker placing it. And that's simply because of the efficiencies of that model. So because basically what's going to happen is, I think of all your trucks move and they're kind of wholesale and they're constantly trying to fill their truck. They're only profitable if their truck is full. So let's say they pick up your car in Maryland and they trundle along and they drop a car off in Virginia. Well, they don't just keep driving on with an empty spot on their trailer. They try to pick up a load in Virginia and maybe it's not going all the way to California, but it's going to go to Texas, right? So they're going to, they're going to go onto what's called a load board and they're going to find a car that basically is somewhere on their route so they can fill that spot. And that's where brokers sort of come in. Um, your company trucks, so for example, Reliable or Inner City or McAllister's there, um, they're a company, um, so they're not a broker. They actually have their own equipment, their own drivers. Um, and a lot of times people will think that's a, a better model and it can be, um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily rule a broker out as being bad. Uh, but understand a broker is really just attempting to place your car with someone who will get it there. And how they get paid is basically the spread. So if they get you to commit to pay, you know, $2,000 to move your car across the country, then they'll go on one of these wholesale boards and they'll try to get it moved for, you know, $1,000 or $1,200 and try to make the $800 as their profit. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So here's a question for you. I, I haven't moved a car in a while, probably maybe five or six years ago, I sent a car from here to my mom's in Orange County, and I believed it was uh, enclosed, and it was about $1,200. Um, one is, you know, uh, East Coast to West Coast pricing nowadays with with the price of fuel, like what can one expect to be an open carrier cost versus an enclosed white glove? Car? Like what, what are people looking at? You know, that's a really tough question because that has changed so much and it's so dynamic for the reasons you talked about. Now that we're facing $6 diesel, right? Mm. I mean, every single truck runs on diesel. So we're running $6 diesel. 
and we've got a we've got a driver shortage and we've got the hottest car market we've ever seen so you've got all these factors coming together and so auto transport's as expensive as it's ever been i mean it used to be as a general rule you could ship cross country uh, open for somewhere a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars depending on where you were going now that's more like you know two grand and the specialty cost you know i don't dare want to step into our sponsors arena because so much of that's going to determine be determined on exactly where it's moving and mm. so if you're going for example on a very common route and you have a more flexible schedule um, you're going to get a much better rate than if you're going to somewhere where they're going to really struggle to fill their truck uh, right. So, so the 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 pickup point and the final destination, and I'm guessing if it's more rural and it's not a route that they normally drive, even though it might be closer in mileage, it might actually cost more. Yeah, because again, they're they're only profitable if their truck is full, and so if they take your car to uh, the middle of nowhere, as an example, and they offload a car, now they have to deadhead or you know drive with an empty spot until they can find another car to take right and so oftentimes as weird as it sounds it's more profitable to take a less a lower paying gig to a more common location than to take an obscure location even if it pays better right now i'm gonna disclose and it's i'm not so particularly proud of this but i do like watching this show called like i think it's called shipping wars <laughs> where you yeah. put your load out there and then people bid on it. is that something that people do i mean I, I obviously i just watch it for the the drama and the the characters on there and how they they like kind of the price goes down and down as as they fight for that that load um is that is that realistic to to do that with the shipping a car you know it it isn't really realistic as a consumer, although there are a couple sites that attempt to do this, but this is essentially how the load board works on a wholesale level. So again, let's say you had contacted me and I'm a, I'm a broker and you say, I want to move my, my Porsche 996 that I'm going to take to parade. And I want to go from Maryland to Palm Springs. As a broker, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to quote you a price that I think you're going to like, right? So I'm going to say to you, okay, I can move your car for $2,500. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to place that car on a load board and I'm going to try to get it as cheap as I can get it, right? Ooh. So that I can make the most amount of money, right? So, but now there's kind of a sweet spot in there because if, if I put too low of a, of a price on it, no one will take my job, mm. right? And so they're going to go on there and they're going to, they're going to kind of look at their competitors. It's a, it's almost like a, think of it as like bring a trailer for shipping mm -hmm. because what it does is it lists all the cars that are available to be moved where they need to go, what the car is, whether it runs or not. Um, and it tells you how much that broker is willing to pay on a per mile basis. And so you can look at it and go, oh, well, this job's paying, you know, 80 cents a mile. I'll take that car. So what happens sometimes is when consumers are shopping for shipping, they're not actually oftentimes dealing with the carrier. And so if a broker promises them a deal that's too good to be true, what ends up happening is that broker is just trying to get the deal and maybe he'll never find a placement because no trucker will take it. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they will. So, because for example, in, back to our old scenario, uh, I've delivered a car, it's in the middle of nowhere, and I think I'm gonna have to drive 600 miles for my next car, and there's a car in this town, and let's say the pay isn't very good, but I'd rather take that than nothing. Yeah. So maybe you just get lucky and the truck driver says, look, I don't like doing this car for $600, but it's better than nothing, and than I'm already nothing, here, yeah. so I'll take it. Um, and then that scenario, generally, the uh, the broker makes out better, right? Because no. the broker makes the spread. Uh, so I'm looking at the chat uh, for tonight, and people had mentioned the auto train. Have you ever shipped a car via auto train? I haven't personally, because I'm a West Coast guy, and oh. uh, you guys have it. But I know quite a few people have used that. I know when we were down at the parade in Boca, you know, mm -hmm. a bunch of our mid-atlantic people uh, use the auto train so you might have more experience than me on yeah that. so for those of you that are watching and are online right now if you've used the auto train let us know what it was like for uh for you to use it and i i don't know if like you can just put your car on there or do you have to like put you can only put your car on the auto train if you're actually riding the auto train down as well like i don't know like is it part of your trip or can you just ship a car by itself um i do know that there are if you're shipping uh, via auto train that there is a ride height limit and um, 
you know, you have to be able to, I guess, load it and not, you know, damage or lower spoilers and all that kind of stuff. So if you're going to do something like that, and even if you're doing it, uh, you know, shipping with a, a, uh, a trucking company, just make sure if you have a especially low car, you know, the regular car haulers might not be able to accommodate the ride height that your car has. And that's where the specialty haulers, you know, come into play. Yeah, that's absolutely true because the other misnomer people have is they, they, um, you know, again, it's Vu, he's in Maryland, he's loading up his 996. You know, he sees the truck driver load that car and he thinks that car is just going to stay in that spot on the truck and then until it gets to California. Well, by the time that truck gets to California, Vu's car may have been loaded and unloaded on that truck a dozen times. And it might even he, arrive on a different truck, right? Oh, absolutely, right? Yeah. Because, again in the idea that they, they only make money if both their wheels are turning and their and their truck is full. Um, let's say that truck goes from Maryland and it gets to, you know, Tennessee and one of his buddies is going to California and they've got, uh, you know, half a load going up north. Well, they may reshuffle the cars between them and one guy takes the load to California and the other guy takes the cars up north, right? Yep. So then it gets All reloaded. All right, well, let's talk about, um, and this, this uh, I have some photos because I had shipped my daughter's car out to Utah. Talk about preparing your car for transport. And that's her uh, lovely cruise, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll share the story that, um, you know, my, my family was, you know, they always look at me funny. They think I'm weird when I'm detailing the cars, but I detailed the heck out of her car right before we were to meet the, uh, the truck driver. And uh, so we get there. And uh, I'm looking at his truck, and it was fairly clean. He was, he was on time, and he pulls out his clipboard, and he was walking around my daughter's car. And he you know, kind of had this puzzled look on his face after he walked around the car, and he said, you know, Mr. Wynn, you know, I've done this a lot, but I, I'm, I've never seen a car this clean, and I don't really see any marks on it. And I actually went to him, and I said, well, I will give you a hint. There are two marks on this car and I can show it to you. And I hope that when you deliver the car to my daughter, she will know that there's those two marks and no other marks. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, it's not to be, you know, super picky or super mean, but I think it's important to convey to that driver, at least in hopes that he will have the car the whole time, that, you know, someone on the other end knows exactly what to expect. So I cleaned the inside, I cleaned the outside, you know, I took pictures of um, the bumpers, like every, Every part that I thought might hit something or touch something on the truck, I took photos of it. And I also took photos of the truck. And I took photos of uh, where he loaded it up and, and such. And um, you know, the, the way the story ends, actually, is when he got to Utah, uh, the car came off. And he, it was him. And he, he told my daughter, you can tell your dad that only the two marks are on the car. So... Any, any tips from you with regards to preparing your car for transport? Well, Vu, you actually hit a lot of the things that I would advise people to do. Um, you know, we, we joke that we're brothers from different mothers, and this is a perfect example. You know, like uh, we had to take my wife's Cayenne in for uh, a service at the dealer. And before we did that, I had to detail her car because, and she thinks I'm crazy. She says, well, first off, they wash it for you. And, of course, she doesn't remember that I always put the note on the steering wheel. Please don't do wash, wash my car. Um, <laughs> But one of the things I, I know being in the auto business is when you get in someone's car and it's immaculate, it sends a very clear message that, hey, someone really likes this car and it matters to them. And mm -hmm. it's notable. And so the driver notices it. And so two things happen. One, he knows you care, so he's going to care, right? Because he knows there's a little bit more pressure. But the other thing is, is that then when the car leaves, you have really good documentation as to what the car is. And so the point about taking photos, all of us have a, a great camera in our pocket with our phones nowadays. Uh, don't be shy. Don't take, you know, one or two faraway pictures. You know, take a whole suite of photos the moment the car is loading. I've run into people and they said, well, I bought this car. And based on the photos in the ad, there was no damage. And I said, well, in fairness to the trucking company, those photos may have been taken days, weeks or months before the car was sold. What you want to do is you want to take a photo literally Ideally, you, you do a full suite of photos around the car and where in the background of the photos is the truck and the truck driver. And then that way, there's no question you can say, well, here's what it looked like the moment it loaded. And if in the situation there's any damage on the other end, um, you, you have pretty good 
evidence as to what the car looked like before it went right um and you mentioned taking pictures of the common areas of wear that's a great point so where you're going to get damage on an auto transport primarily uh front and rear bumper covers particularly on the bottoms they're going to mm-hmm. they're going to run them aground the lower rockers you know from them running aground uh wheel rash so you know so you want to photo all the bumpers underneath the bumpers the the uh the wheels um you want to do look at the top surfaces because oftentimes if there's something loaded above it, it might leak on top of it, um, things like that. Take a picture of the odometer. Um, that way you can prove what the mileage was when it loaded. And do expect that there might be, you know, a few tenths of a mile added. You know, if you pick it up and 30 miles were added to it, um, I might be a little bit upset. Uh, that would be putting it politely, but you know, stranger things have happened. So uh, just take all those photos. Um when the car loads. And then the next piece of that is the driver will give you what's called a bill of lading. Uh, first off, make sure you get one. Uh, sometimes it seems nice that the truck driver is very casual. Uh, you want a bill of lading. This is your receipt that shows they accepted the car um, and it should note any damages that are on there. And before you sign that, make sure you agree with what the truck driver wrote. One of the one of the tricks the truck drivers will use, and again, not denigrating them anyway, but they'll go really fast and they'll just put lots of marks everywhere and it'll be hard to tell what exactly they're marking. And so let's say it gets to the other end. You say, oh, well, there wasn't this scratch on the bumper and they'll kind of point to the mark on the bill of lading and say, oh, we marked it. Mm. Well, now it's hard to argue with because it's marked and you signed for it. Mm -hmm. So before you sign basically accepting that as truth, make sure you agree with what the truck driver put down on that bill of lading. Um, Closer related, some of the, the newer drivers or the uh, some companies have gone electronic. So oftentimes they'll take a suite of photos as well and there'll be an electronic bill of lading. Uh, works exactly the same way. So just make sure you agree with any damages that they note are true and accurate. We have a note here from uh, Goody. Can you ship your car with a cover or is that overkill? Um, you never want to ship your car with a cover. Um, for a myriad of reasons. Um, On an open transport, uh, you would suffer significant damage just with the wind flap. Um, So you wouldn't want that. Um, So on an open transport, no. Um, Then a lot of people think, well, on an enclosed, that would be better because something dripped from above. Uh, For kind of the same reasons, even these enclosed trailers are not hermetically sealed, you know, pressurized vessels. Um, So there's still a lot going on there. Um, one of the things just to understand when you ship a car, um, 99% chance it will show up and it will be dirtier when it comes than when it left you. And just as long as you go into it, knowing that's how it's going to be. Um, obviously when you go to one of the specialty carriers, um, what you should find is the car maybe has a little bit of a layer of dust on it. Uh, but it's pretty darn clean. Um, if you ship on an open carrier, particularly in the wintertime, it could come out looking like you can't even see out the windows. It's so filthy. Um, and it's just kind of par for the course. So I know some people um, use painter's tape, you know, in, in areas and try to cover the areas that might get scratched. And this is my personal opinion, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, because uh, what I would be more worried is you're putting painter's tape on paint to make sure there's, you know, it can absorb a scratch or something like that. But especially if it's going to be an open carrier, what I don't, the reason why I don't like it is because if the car gets wet, the moisture is going to get underneath that painter's tape and then it's going to stop raining and then sunshine is going to come out and then there's going to be heat and now you have that water sort of boiling under the paint and bubbling and creating all sorts of mess and then and then the tape will release and then some of it will stick and half of it will release and now you've got this whipping you know belt of you know dirty debris and mud or whatever so i would say just clean it and leave it alone. Don't tape it. Don't do. It. Don't put a cover on it. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that is if you're worried about the car enough that you want to go to that length, then spend the money on a specialized transport. Mm-hmm. Because even though specialized transport might be uh, one and a half or two times as expensive as a more common carrier, what's the cost of damage on our cars? Yep. Right. Even the simplest thing that the savings you quote had is going to evaporate. And so, yeah, if you're that worried about it, um, go specialty. You know, if I was thinking about 
blue painters tape i i am a fan of a couple of different companies make it it's a temporary paint protection film mm. um, you could use a product like that but again if i'm that worried about my car i'm going to spend the money and i'm going to go with you know one of the more premier carriers now what about stuff inside the car is that a if you can hide it in there do it or you don't recommend um, it i never recommend it for a couple reasons um number one reason you know some people particularly those who are like moving they think oh it's like a free moving truck you know i can just pack my car full of my personal effects and that way i don't have to pay to ship stuff um one that the truckers hate this um and the reason they hate it is the truck is always limited by the weight that it can carry right so they're looking at how they load their truck based on what they assume your car weighs and so if they think okay i've got a three thousand pound porsche and lo and behold customers shoved a thousand pounds worth of books and other garbage inside the car um that that messes up their scale weight and everything else um, so that's one reason not to do it the other reason not to do it is that the transport company is not liable for that and so i guess if you transport a bunch of stuff you don't care about maybe that maybe that's the thing to do um but as a general rule i leave nothing in the car that i'm concerned about losing absolutely nothing um so no i would I, think most of the cars that are on trailers probably aren't even locked because modern cars when you lock them the alarm sets and if they drive down the road then they're gonna have six cars with alarms going off so they probably just leave them unlocked i'm guessing uh bingo yeah the majority yeah. of truck drivers actually leave the cars not only unlocked but generally the keys in them as well oh keys in them uh, as well yeah I mean, wow. for one reason, I mean, it would be really hard for someone to get all the, the cars off. You haven't the watched Fast and Furious. They can yeah. climb on the car carrier and just <laughs> back them out. <laughs> and release them. Um, but yeah, they don't lock them because of that very reason, because the alarms are all going to go off and the batteries yeah. are going to go dead. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's not a particularly secure way to transport your stuff. Let's move on to now that you've got your car on the transporter, you've chosen enclosed versus open. Now it's heading west to Palm Springs for a parade. What's the process on receiving the car? Yeah, so I, I think the other big thing to talk about is timing. Again, a lot of people have this idea they, they, they call Oh, we it. had a timing chart. Maybe okay, yeah. Um, so again, they, they have this idea that, okay, I. Uh, the transporter, and I hate to say this because, again, we're not denigrating them, but it's what happens because they feel the pressure to get the business, right? So someone calls and they say, oh, I've got parade and I need my car there by July 1st. And so the, the person they're speaking to says, yeah, no problem, Vu, we can get it there July 1st. Well, it just, uh, life doesn't work that cleanly because, again, now you're, you imagine you're driving this truck, you got your eight cars and you're trundling across the U.S. And the first car you're supposed to drop off is in Nashville. And it's a Saturday and you call the person who's got that car in Nashville and they say, oh, geez, I didn't know you were coming. We're, we're, we're in Georgia at a cousin's wedding. We're not even home. You know, we can't make it back till Monday morning. Well, now that truck driver who thought by Monday he was already going to be in Texas is now still idling in Nashville because those people aren't there to accept his car. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see all these things. Then all of a sudden he gets to Texas. as he moves west. <laughs> Then he gets to Texas and there's road construction or, you know, whatever, you know, comes up or there's weather. And so, yeah, what started as a two day delay in Nashville becomes three days by Texas and it's five days by Arizona. And so now you've said, well, gosh, parade starts July one and this guy hasn't showed up with my car. <laughs> so yeah. um, the one thing to know is if you need absolute guaranteed delivery date, you will pay an enormous premium for that. Mm -hmm. So now the slide yeah. that that Robert has on here about the 11-hour driving limit. I'm actually familiar with this. This is uh, hours of service. There, there's a limitation on, you know, how long a truck driver can drive and be working, and that's for safety. Obviously, you don't want truck drivers to be able to drive 24 hours a day and not take any rest, and uh, you know, uh, and, and be tired while driving these these huge uh, weighted vehicles. Um, so they have a limitation on how many hours they can work. They have a limitation on how many hours they can drive and they try to drive t to match where they need to drop things off. So when they're stopping to drop your car off, they're hoping they can, they can rest and sort of reset there. But when you have people that you're expecting to come and they don't, and then they're still working, but they're not resting 
and then it, it becomes a puzzle piece that you can't put together. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's I, that's is why again I, I, I'm very empathetic of those in the industry because you know a lot of times consumers have no idea what they're up against, and so to your point, you might have a truck driver who says, "Okay, I can make it to Nashville. I got to drop this car." Well, when that person says they can't accept it, that throws their whole schedule off, mm-hmm. and so now they got to restart their clock on a day, and they're I mean, it just it it messes everything up. Yeah. Um, and, and this is why, again, I feel bad, but oftentimes the truck drivers will make up fanciful stories because they know the average consumer doesn't understand their industry. So they'll make up some story about a dead grandma or some sort of crazy mechanical failure in Albuquerque. I mean, they, they, they get to be kind of comical. I wish that there was just a thing in the industry where we all just agreed to basically tell the truth. But uh, just be it's prepared for, for some fanciful story. Yeah. Oh, totally. You yeah. know, because how do you kick a guy because his grandma died? Uh, right. versus trying to explain how some rude person in Nashville wouldn't accept their car. <laughs> so, so having said all that, uh, we were talking about taking delivery. Um, I know two instances. One, my, my nephew, he had shipped a car from California, and we got a call to take delivery of the car at, like, midnight. We were just happy the car arrived, uh, you know, but that's probably not the smartest time to take delivery when it was dark on the side of the road. Um, uh, two buddies just sent me a picture earlier today where they took delivery of uh, their 911 in the middle of the night. And again, I'm sure truck drivers are just trying to make the schedule work. But you had mentioned taking delivery of your car, you don't want to add to the problem, but it's also your car and you've paid for it and taking receiving it in the dark or in the rain is not that great of an idea. So elaborate on that. Yeah. And again, this is the challenge. So the truck drivers, he's running behind. He desperately wants to get your car offloaded because he needs to make up some time. And so if you've ever transported a car, you're going to get a call from your truck driver at literally 10 o'clock at night. And he wants to meet you at midnight in some foreign truck stop somewhere. Um, and he'll oftentimes apply a lot of pressure to you to get you to do it because Again, he's going to get heat from everyone down the line. So you can appreciate where he's coming from. But in much the same way I advise people, you don't buy a car in the dark. You don't inspect a car in the rain. Uh, Don't accept your car that way. So if there's any possible way for you to accommodate the truck driver, like in my world, if a truck driver calls me and it's 8 o'clock at night and it's summer and it's still light out, even though I might be eating dinner with my family, I think, you know what, he wants to get home to his family I'll cut out and I'll accommodate him because I think it's just a kind human thing to do. But if he wants to meet me at midnight in a dark parking lot and wants me to sign off on a quarter million dollar car, I'm simply not going to do it because the risk to me is just too big. And and I tell you that because just like when we loaded the car, we inspected it carefully and compared it with the bill of lading, you want to do the exact same thing when the car arrives. And obviously you can't do a good job if you're doing that in a parking lot and it's dark or if it's raining and so you want to accept the car during the day. And ideally, if you're accepting it somewhere where the weather's bad, you can pull it inside and, and dry the car off and actually look at it. Um, and that's really how you want to do that. And you'll get a lot of pressure from the driver not to do it that way. Um, they'll usually offload the car, say sign here, and they'll literally be tapping their pen on the clipboard and wanting you to go. Uh, but do take your time walking around the car because what you need to do is if there is any damage on the car, you want to make note of it and it has to be written on the bill of lading. No matter what the truck driver tells you, if you do not notate the damage on the bill of lading, you do not have a case with their insurance company. So let's say you, you loaded that cruise, it was perfect VU, and it shows up in Salt Lake and there's a big scuff on the rear bumper and your daughter, she's kind of anxious, she doesn't know what to do, so she signs the bill of lading and then she calls you and says, oh, geez, dad, it looks good, but there's this big scuff. If she signed that bill of lading and she didn't note it, you're out of luck. Ooh. So you want to make sure you notate that, you take a picture, and you can release the driver. What you can say is, okay, I've taken a picture, and I've noted on the bill of lading, you know, hey, damage to rear bumper left side. Um, I took a photo, and you, ha- you sign that and have the driver notate that he signed it as well. And then that way you can then file a claim uh, for damage. But if you do not put it on the bill of lading, uh, you're gonna have a a tough road. Now, speaking of insurance, let's say 
you bought a car. Okay, let's say you bought this this 2022 car. Um, seller is got the money from you. Call took the tags off of it. No longer insures. It has their insurance on that car. It gets loaded up on on a transporter a week later, headed to you. You haven't received the car. You have entitled the car. So you haven't told your insurance company about the car. Now you're relying, I think you're relying on the transport company's insurance and then something does happen uh, when, when you receive it. How does that all work? Like, does your own insurance have like a grace period of some sort or? Well, in theory, in most states, insurance companies do have a grace period, but why would you risk it? You just spent a lot of money on a car. The, in my world, the moment you send money for a car, you got a signed bill of, of a sale on a car and you've sent someone money, you own that car. The very next phone call I make is to my insurance agent. Mm. I say, I bought this 2022 Cayenne because for the week or two that it's before it comes, what's that going to cost you an extra 50 bucks? I mean, yeah. uh, you're, you're a fool not to just make sure you've got that covered. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people think, well, the, the transport company has insurance. Well, there's a couple reasons that's not always true. First off, the transport company is responsible if they cause damage or kind of while it's under their care, but there's exclusions to that. So for example, an act of God. So they're driving somewhere, it's a hailstorm, a tornado, right? Those are acts mm -hmm. of God that, that would not be covered on the transport's insurance. Uh, hmm, interesting. So don't be silly if you bought something as, uh, as, as Nathan said, just put insurance on it. That's the next call. All right, Nathan, you still there? Okay, so he'll call in. Um, let's move into DIY. So actually, before we do that, while we're trying to get Nathan reconnected, I believe we have some winners for the hat. So can we pull up the winners for the 70th anniversary? We've got Jeff Jones from Florida Crown, C. Ritchie from Peach State, uh, Curtis uh, ASIM BNZ, Rick Butler from Golden Gate, and Caleb from Western Michigan. So if you folks would just drop us an email or follow the instructions that are in the live chat, we will send these hats right over to you. Oh, welcome back, Nathan. Uh, I just announced the winners of the hats and we're going to change gears into uh, DIY towing. And I know you've done quite a bit of towing, not only with your business, but coming to parade. And after talking about all these transporters, if you feel as though you can do a better job and you do have a vehicle that can pull a trailer, maybe that's an option for you. But before you do that, maybe you should listen to a few tips from Nathan about towing your own vehicle. Okay, so is that going to be me talking about the U-Haul uh, trailer? U-Haul makes an amazing trailer. And there's the U-Haul trailer that we used to haul Project 964. And um, for not a lot of money, you get a very well-built trailer that's fairly easy to load, easy to strap down. Um, what else do you have to say about that, Nathan? You know, the funny thing is the U-Haul trailer looks really crummy, but I, I will give the engineer who designed these trailers uh, an A-plus. I mean, they're durable as heck, and they actually do a pretty remarkably good job. There are some limitations to them, however, uh, particularly with Porsches. Um, you will struggle with any Porsche which has either uh, a non-factory suspension ride height um, mm -hmm. or even one that's more of a performance-oriented car or anyone that has kind of an aero kit or a front spoiler. Um, the ramps are not particularly long, um, so you're going to need to be creative about working around that. And then the other thing is, is the front, the way these things load is you, you drive over kind of a, a stop at the front and there's a lip. You can see on this 964 where the straps are, um, that lip's pretty high. And so what you end up having to do is uh, cut some pieces of wood oftentimes as blocks to put under the front wheels so that you, the front bumper will actually clear that lip. Um, so what I always do when I'm going to rent a U-Haul trailer is I, I go to Home Depot and I cut several pieces of big, you know, like two by sixes. Um, so I have a, you know, blocks for the front and also a way of extending those ramps. And if you do that, you can actually haul most any Porsche on there. Um, the other thing that's cool is that left fender actually folds over so you can open the door. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty creative little setup. 
The only drawback I will say to them, other than the low clearance, is that there is no protection for frontal impact, meaning whatever sprays up behind your tow vehicle is going to be directly onto, you know, all your wear surfaces oh, on the front of the I car, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, in particular, you know, like you know, you're definitely want to have some sort of mud flaps or something on your truck to keep all the rocks and stuff off the road from not just flinging directly onto the trailer. You can kind of see how that would be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a track car or something you're not that worried about, or you have a car that has paint protection film on it, it's probably fine. Um, but if you have a show car and you want it perfect, uh, this is where I would probably wrap the front end in uh, some temporary paint protection film um, or something along those lines just for impact resistance. But really, other than that, um, they're pretty good. You can generally rent one of these things locally for like 59 bucks for the day. And then in terms of when you move one way, like you're taking a car from one place to another, um, the rate gets quite a bit more expensive. You may spend five, six, seven hundred dollars um, But one trick you can try is if you're, let's say you're going a thousand miles or something, you might go on the U-Haul site and you'll type it in and they might charge you $600 to use it one way for a thousand dollars but you're only taking it for three days and your local rate's 50 bucks. So even though you have to tow it empty half the way, you might be able to get it for 150 and just rent it local and then tow it both ways. So that makes any kind of sense. Yep. Yep. The other thing that's nice about those trailers is if you don't do it often and you have, I think it's a class three hitch with a two inch ball and you have a light connector for it, that's all you need. You don't need a brake controller for these because these have, I believe, surge brakes so all you need is the, the, the hitch and the light and, you know, obviously a vehicle that can handle um, pulling a trailer. And actually on the U-Haul website, you, they ask you to put in the make and model of your vehicle to quote unquote qualify to be able to rent one of their trailers. But it's a pretty neat setup. I use it quite a bit um, for around town towing. We, we obviously used it for the 964 car here. And um, so if, if you plan to go that route, one, it's good, but then also don't let your maiden voyage be a long haul trip. Like I would rent one, um, you know, and, and, and practice because you, if you've never backed up a trailer, if you've never driven your vehicle with a trailer and a car on it, you don't want to do it for the first time going out, you know, a thousand miles, right? Absolutely. I mean, the, um, they are pretty easy to tow, but I will say because they, they build them that the average American can't kill this trailer, they're very heavy for an open trailer. So, you know, by the time you put a Porsche on there uh, of any note, you're going to be 6,000 pounds. Um, so it's not an inconsequentially sized trailer in terms of its weight. So be, be cognizant of that. And if, yeah, if you don't have any trailering experience, I would even go so far as say I probably wouldn't have my first trailer experience be towing a car I really, really like, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I might get used to towing a, a yard trailer or my jet skis or something where I get a little bit more experience before I uh, – because towing a trailer is just like any other skill. You get better at it the more you do it. And so, yeah, I do always get a little nervous. You, you always see this you know, family and they've got this U-Haul hooked up to another trailer and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, uh, that, that looks scary. So those of you that are watching uh, live right now, feel free to ask questions. I'm going to go through them right now. Uh, Mark Woodsma was talking about U-Haul trailers are very heavy being steel. Is that an issue? Yeah. Like I said, I, they're designed that you absolutely can't kill that trailer. Mm -hmm. And that's their number one purpose. And so, you know, a typical 20-foot, you know, uh, steel car trailer usually weighs 15 or 1600 pounds. If you buy one of those really lightweight, like a Trail X, uh, they're as low as under a thousand pounds. And these U Haul trailers, I think, are like 2800 pounds. Oh, wow. So by the time you put that 964 C4, which is a 3200 pound car, it's a 6000 pound. So if you look at that and you say, well, officially the only Porsche that could tow that would be a Cayenne because mm -hmm. they're rated at 7700. But even 6000 pounds really stretches the limits of most, you know, mid-sized SUVs and things like that, you're going to want a, a half-ton pickup truck or uh, I think you can see in there Manny was pulling it with a Suburban would be fine. Um, so you want to pay particular attention to the tow rating. The other thing to know is that because not as much with a Porsche, but with other cars, uh, you put a lot of the tongue weight, which is the weight on the, on the front of the trailer. And so oftentimes you may be under capacity for tow, but even on something like a Cayenne, 
Um, if you actually scale one of those things, you'll find that a trailer, a U-Haul with a front engine Porsche, oftentimes will be have way too much tongue weight to really be safely towed. Mm. We have another question here uh, from Andrew Lyons. How to tie down in an enclosed trailer? Ah, uh, there's, there's a lot of debate about this. Um, you know, what I always do is I reference what does Porsche say? And so there is an official standard that they actually reference for how they want their cars tied down. And so uh, Porsche on any of their modern cars uh, uses wheel straps. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people will argue about this, but basically uh, the, the Porsche approved method is you actually tie down through the strap or through the spokes mm -hmm. um, uh, and kind of use a D ring. It's hard to describe on there. One of the companies that I really like their products is a company called Max, M-A-C apostrophe S. I think they're out of Idaho. They're a U.S. company and they actually build all their stuff in-house. And they'll actually, you tell them what trailer you have and you tell them what you're hauling and they'll suggest a solution and they'll build it custom for you. So um, that's probably the way I would go. Um, or like I do like how the U-Haul trailer does it. You can see it actually ratchets down the strap over the tire itself. Um, some people feel like if you do the wheel strap uh, through the spokes and you cinch it down extra tight, that there's the potential that you could throw off alignment. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I agree with that. What I like about wheel straps is then the car rides on its own suspension. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will, will, will try to tie it down somewhere else and they want to cinch it down really tight and they kind of snub it down and so the car is no longer riding on its own suspension, uh, which I don't really think is the best plan. Another question from Andrew, um, actually two here. Uh, first is with the 911 having the engine in the back, is there a proper way to load it? And the second question is, is it okay to use the front tow hook to secure the vehicle to the trailer? Um, for the 911, um, no. Um, the tow hook is specifically used for recovery purposes. So, for example, in a water cool car, it threads in, and that's where, like, if you were in an accident, the tow company would use that to pull the car out of the ditch or whatever. Um, and so you could you can put the winch cable on there or something, but that's not its tie down. Um, the factory does have approved tie down locations, which on modern Porsches are wheel straps. Um, on older Porsches, like for example a 356, you can use an axle strap um, on those cars. Uh, but no, I would not use. Um, the front tie down, particularly on older ones, because they're not that strong. And if you have any kind of degradation or rust, uh, you could hit a bump and find out you tore out your whole <laughs> tow hook. <laughs> and there's no Which longer you... a car on your trailer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not yeah. a good idea. Yeah. All right. So, Robert, let's see if we can throw up Nathan's tips and a bit of a summary here. I think we're going to have a. I think there's a range. Okay. So, I'll let yeah. you run through the slides. I'm glad we came back to that because we got cut off whenever my connection died, but um, the insurance, so make sure you have insurance. The other big thing is make sure how much insurance that carrier has. And so uh, you just ask that question, how much insurance are you carrying? And what you want to know is you want to know not, not their liability coverage, but their cargo insurance. And then you want to know how big a truck they have. So for example, if they say, oh, no worries, I, I carry $400,000 of the coverage. Well, but they have an eight car trailer, which means that they're on average $50,000 a car. But what if they have three Porsches on there that are a couple hundred thousand dollars a piece and their trailer burns down? Now we got mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure uh, that your carrier carries enough coverage for all the cars they're carrying, not just your own. Because if they suffer a loss and they're underinsured, you got a real problem. And again, a shout out to sort of our sponsors. These guys are carrying significant insurance, you know, oftentimes several million dollars. With that said, if you do have a very, very, very valuable car, you need to make sure you declare that with the shipper. And oftentimes they'll make you take out a separate rider if the car is, you know, let's say you're shipping a million dollar car. They'll often make you take out a rider or you just have to decide I'm willing to take the risk. Um, but do not assume that they're because. They ca can't cost effectively carry enough insurance for things like that. Does that yep. make any sense? All right, next tip. Yeah, we talked about this. Your bill of lading basically is you signing and accepting the car as is. And so if there's any damage, you need to note this before you sign the bill of lading. 
Um, yep, again, the rain or at night, we talked a little bit about this. And again, I feel bad. So if you can accommodate the truck driver in any way possible, I think that's a nice, humane thing to do, but not to your own detriment. And so if you have to interrupt supper or something and it's still nice and light out and it's sunny, yeah, that's irritating, but I would probably do that. Uh, but I'm not going to go out at midnight in the rain to accept my car. I'm just not going to do it. Too big a risk. Ah, enclosed doesn't mean your car won't sit outside. A lot of people have this idea, again, that this truck driver picks up your car um, and it goes the entire way. Um, on a specialty carrier, this is the case. Uh, but on sort of your common ones where maybe they'll tell you, you pay a little extra, we'll do enclosed. But in this scenario, as the freight's moving across the U.S., oftentimes it gets loaded and unloaded. And it may get unloaded for several days somewhere until it's waiting for another truck to go where it needs to go. And so it may sit in a lot in, you know, who knows where, you know, Springfield, uh, Illinois or something until it gets onto a truck that's headed to Denver. So uh, don't assume it will never be outside. Yep. I always tell people just whatever they tell you for timeline, double it um, and understand it will generally not come on time. And so if you have a deadline, like you, you're hiring this car to be moved for a specific event, what I would make sure that you do is you have a trusted friend on the other end and get the car there early. And so if parade is July 1 and you have a friend and let's say maybe they're not in Palm Springs, but they're in San Diego, you're better off to say, hey, will you accept my car and you arrange to have it arrive by June 15. Then it'll probably show up June 28th. You fly into San Diego instead of Palm Springs and you drive it the 150 miles to parade. That's a much better way than assuming it's going to show up the day before the Concours. Uh, that's a fool's errand and you're not going to be happy. All right. Well, that wraps up transporting your Porsche. Um, thank you, Nathan. The next Tech Tactics Live, we're going to be talking about tires and we're going to have our sponsor, uh, Pirelli. And they will be here. We'll have a special guest. I saw that uh, you just threw up a photo of Works Reunion Monterey. That's happening August 19th at the Monterey Pines Golf Course. Hopefully we will see you all there. We also have Sports Car Together Fest coming up September 2nd through the 4th. We have Parade Laps, Corral, a GT theme DE. We have racing going on at Indy. If, you're, uh, if you haven't made your reservations, make sure you do so. We also dropped a number of, oh, we're talking about the podcast here. We dropped the recent podcast number 19. If you haven't checked that out, please do so. We are now doing the videos or the uh, uh, podcast in-house and we'll go weekly. Here we're looking at the one mile review of the 996 Cabriolet here. We've got a number of one mile reviews out there. Have a look if you enjoy the content on our YouTube channel. Again, please help us get to the 100K subscriber level by simply clicking subscribe yourself. And with that, I bid you farewell. Until next time, thank you, Nathan. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, Vu.